All right, welcome back. So this week we're gonna pick up with the cardiovascular system. We're gonna divide that into three parts. The first part is blood, what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and then we'll get to the heart, and then finally to blood vessels. So in terms of the blood, the primary function of blood is to transport things. And so the main thing that it transports is oxygen. And you can see there pictured in the lower right, those are some of your red blood cells. The technical term for them is, is erythrocytes. Um, and so their job is to bind to oxygen and then transport that oxygen to the tissues so that we can make energy. So uh, at the tissues, so for example, in a, a working muscle cell, we're gonna use that oxygen to remake ATP. And so ATP is the energy molecule. When we split it, that gives off free energy. And then that energy allows us, or it drives uh, muscle contraction. So we use oxygen to help us make ATP and then we use the ATP to drive muscle contraction. We also use that ATP to drive uh, some of the sodium potassium pumps that we've talked about previously. So that's an, another thing that we need oxygen again to make the ATP to do the cellular work that different, uh, different cells need to do. So in addition to carrying oxygen, blood also helps us to transport and excrete waste products. So a byproduct of the energy production process, a byproduct of making ATP aerobically, which means using oxygen, uh, is carbon dioxide. And so we have to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And so what we'll do is, for example, when a muscle cell produces that carbon dioxide, it will then diffuse into the bloodstream. Most of it's carried in the plasma. And then when the blood gets to the lungs, we will excrete or breathe out that carbon dioxide and get rid of it. So we can transport transport waste products in the blood as well. And in addition to carbon dioxide, we also transport things that are the byproducts of protein breakdown. So uh, urea and ammonia, again, byproducts of, of uh, breaking down protein, will be transported in the blood as well. So we'll transport those to the kidneys, for example, to excrete them uh, in urine. And then blood also transports hormones. So the body has two uh, control systems. The first is the nervous system which we covered pretty extensively in 201. The second is the endocrine system. And so the endocrine system, um, the communicators of the endocrine system are your hormones. And so hormones are chemical messengers that are secreted into the blood or lymphatic system. In the case of the blood, the hormones circulate throughout the body and whatever tissues have receptors for those hormones will then receive the hormone and then it'll produce its effect in that tissue. So hormones, include things like insulin, which is gonna cause the muscles to take glucose out of the blood, but include other things like testosterone, uh, growth hormone, we'll talk about a hormone later, erythropoietin. So those are those chemical messengers. So the blood transports those as well. In addition to transporting things, blood plays an important regulatory role. So one of the things that it regulates is our core temperature. So for example, when we get hot, we will dilate blood vessels near the skin surface, and then the blood can give up some of its fluid component, which is called plasma, and then that plasma becomes sweat, and then we uh, secrete the sweat onto the skin surface, and then whenever that sweat evaporates, that takes some of our heat with it, and so then that helps cool us down. So through its plasma, through the fluid component of the blood, blood plays a really important role in helping us maintain our core temperature, primarily in helping to keep us from getting too hot. It, it functions, again, to help us produce sweat. Blood also helps us to maintain pH, which is our acid-base balance. So blood itself is slightly basic, and blood also acts as a reservoir um, of bicarbonate ions, which help us to uh, maintain pH. So for example, um, Whenever we exercise, we're gonna produce lactate or lactic acid as a byproduct of high intensity exercise. Um, and then that will leave the muscle cells, it'll go into the blood, and we can neutralize that acid in the blood. And then as a, a product of that buffering process, we'll actually increase our breathing rate. So one of the things that drives an increase in breathing rate during exercise is trying to blow off, trying to breathe out that carbon dioxide, the excess carbon dioxide that's produced as a result of that buffering process. So blood helps us to maintain our pH. It also helps to protect us against inf infection. So our uh, white blood cells travel via the blood. So the blood is kind of uh, their, their superhighway, helps them get to where they need to go. Um, 
And then for the most part, the, the white blood cells, the immune cells do their work you know, in the tissue. So they'll, they'll migrate out of the bloodstream and into um, the loose connective tissue, for example. And so they'll do some of their work there. Or those uh, white blood cells will end up on the lymphatic side and they'll do some of their work there. But at the very least, blood helps uh, to transport those immune cells around to the different tissues where they would need to go so that they can attack any invaders. So in terms of the characteristics of blood, so obviously blood is red, but it's not, um, it's not a constant color. So blood's color can vary a little bit from a, a really bright red, if it is well oxygenated or, or full of oxygen, to more of a darker red, kind of a maroon color if the blood is deoxygenated. So for example, if you've ever given blood, um, whether it's for a test where they take out just a vial or an actual blood donation, you've probably noticed that the blood is almost like a maroon color. It's a pretty dark color. That's because that is deoxygenated blood. So it's blood with a reduced oxygen content because they're taking it from a vein. So you've got arteries and you've got veins. You already knew that. But the arteries carry uh, oxygenated blood. The veins carry deoxygenated blood. So on the arterial side, which is the high pressure side, that's the, the freshly oxygenated blood that's leaving the heart. Um, that's a high pressure side. And so um, for example, if you are curious about your heart rate, one of the things that you might do is take your two fingers, put them right next to your windpipe in, in your neck, and then you can feel your carotid pulse there, right? So that's your carotid artery. And so we wouldn't want to take blood from the arterial side because there's that high pressure, there's that spurting effect. And so that would be, um, that would be dangerous, but also potentially messy. So um, they take blood whenever you donate it from the venous side, that's the low pressure side, and the blood just kind of oozes back to the heart, especially when you're at rest. Um, and so, but because of that, because it's on the, um, the venous side, then that blood, because it has a reduced oxygen content, has kind of a maroonish color to it. So one of the things that I've been asked in the past, it's been a while, um, but a student uh, years ago said, okay, well, if blood is red, how come my veins are blue? Because she genuinely thought on the venous side that blood was blue. Um, and the answer to that question, because it is an interesting question, right? So the, the answer to that question is that yes, your, your blood is red, but the reason that your veins appear blue is because of the overlying skin, fat, and fascia. And so what ends up happening is those overlying layers of tissue scatter most of the red portion of the white light um, before it can, can uh, reflect off the blood and instead, the blue portion of the, the light spectrum is reflected, and that's what bounces back to our eyes. So since the skin, fat, and fascia um, essentially refract the red portion there, that's not what we see. And instead, when the blue portion of the spectrum bounces back to our eyes, we see that blue color in the veins, and so then um, that's what it gives it. So it's, it's the overlying tissue that gives blood the blue color in the, in the veins that you see. It's really a similar effect to what you see in the sunset. So the sun itself is white, but at sunset, the sun can appear kind of a red or a pinkish color. And that's because uh, the blue colors are being scattered away by the atmosphere. And so as a result, then the sun looks like it's red or pink. So similar effect. So your blood is not blue, it is red, um, but lighter or darker red, depending on oxygen content. Uh, the other thing there, so I mentioned that blood is slightly basic. Um, so again, and it also plays a role in uh, buffering. So when we start to become acidic, as we do during intense exercise, blood helps to buffer that. Uh, blood is also viscous, it's also thick. So you've heard the expression that blood is thicker than water, and of course it is. Um, and the reason that it is, is because of all of the formed elements that are in blood. So you've got um, red blood cells, you've got white blood cells, you've got platelets, and then you've got a variety of other things in blood as well. And so because of that, because of all those things that are dissolved in blood or that are floating around in blood, um, it is much thicker than water. Um, so viscosity, if something is viscous, think about it as being like motor oil. Because if you're anything like me, um, the only time you've ever heard the term viscosity was probably in a motor oil commercial. Um, and so if something is more viscous, it's thicker, it's gonna flow more slowly. If something is less viscous, it's a thinner liquid and it's gonna flow more quickly. So viscosity of the blood changes depending on your hydration status. So if you are um, really dehydrated, you lose a lot of that plasma volume of the blood and so then the blood becomes effectively thicker. You got the same number of red blood cells floating around in less fluid uh, and less plasma and so the effect then is more viscous or thicker blood. The last thing on there is blood volume. So um, 
if we're estimating blood volumes or just you know playing with numbers, um, talking about things like cardiac output, how much blood's pumped per minute, typically the number that we use is uh, five liters of blood. So the average person has about five liters of blood. Um, it depends on stature. It depends on your training status, um, on your how acclimated you are to the heat. There are a number of factors that play into it, but in general, because men tend to be larger, men tend to have a little higher blood volume, so they tend to be in kind of that five to six liters range. Women, because they tend to be smaller, tend to be more like four to five liters. So, but on average, usually if we're talking about how much blood somebody has, the, the ballpark figure is about five liters of blood. Um, Blood can make up, since you have five liters of it, can make up somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10% of your uh, body weight. And so why that matters is um, that's an area where sometimes in weight sports, so things like uh, weightlifting, powerlifting, wrestling, boxing, those kinds of sports, where you have to be in a certain weight class, that's um, one of the areas where people will try to lose weight quickly is basically they'll try to sweat it out, give up plasma volume. And so by doing that, then you can decrease your body weight. But of course, that's pretty dangerous. Uh, makes the heart have to work harder because your blood's thicker now, but also makes you less resistant to heat uh, exposure as you uh, lose more and more sweat. And all right, so we covered all that. So then on to the two major components. So as mentioned, the two major components of blood, so you got plasma and you got your formed elements. And your formed elements, the major one, are your erythrocytes, your red blood cells. So again, the plasma is the fluid component of blood that everything else floats around in. So it's kind of a, and you can see it here, it's kind of a straw or yellowish color to that fluid, and it is 90% water, and it's a little bit sticky. Um, and then as far as the formed elements go, so again, the primary formed element are your erythrocytes, your red blood cells. Um, and so what we've done here, or what this person has had happen, is they've uh, had blood drawn, and then the blood's been put in the centrifuge, and so then the heavier things, which are the formed elements, uh, if we spin blood really fast, the heavier things are gonna sink to the bottom, so those are your erythrocytes, and then the lighter thing, which is the fluid component, is gonna rise to the top. And so we've separated those out, so the plasma's up here, the uh, red blood cells are down here, and then here in the middle, those are our white blood cells and our platelets that are gonna help us in clotting. So, um, as far as the erythrocytes, the red blood cells go, there's an important term related to them, which is hematocrit. And so hematocrit deals with what percent of blood volume is comprised of red blood cells. So in this graphic, they've got 45% of their blood is uh, red blood cells, and so they are, the hematocrit for this person is 45%. So that number also varies. So uh, for men, the average is 47%. So for men, 47% uh, of their blood on average is red blood cells. And that can vary plus or minus 5%. So they may be as high as like 52% or as low as 42%. Women, on the other hand, tend to have a little bit lower hematocrit. So if men average 47%, women average more like 42%. Again, plus or minus 5%. So women may be as high as 47% or as low as uh, 37%. One of the reasons that women uh, have a lower hematocrit is testosterone. So both men and women have testosterone, but of course men tend to have a lot more of it. Um, and so testosterone can increase production of red blood cells. So because men have more testosterone, men tend to have more red blood cells as well. The other things in the, in the formed elements, so we've got our leukocytes, which are your white blood cells, will be involved in immune function, and then platelets, which will be involved in blood clotting. All right, so speaking of erythrocytes, things to know about them as far as their structure goes, they kind of look like little uh, inner tubes that you float down the river on, uh, except that they're not hollow in the middle. So the middle is still closed in, but they look like little inner tubes. So they are flat disks, as you can see there. And the reason that matters is, again, the primary job of a red blood cell is to carry oxygen. And so oxygen diffuses with its concentration gradient, so it's gonna go, actually oxygen flow, sorry, um, with concentration, but also with its pressure gradient. So oxygen goes from areas of high pressure to low pressure, but it doesn't diffuse very far. And so if our red blood cells were one big ball, that would be a lot farther for our oxygen to diffuse. And so the red blood cells wouldn't be as effective at offloading or onloading oxygen in that case. And so the fact that they are flat disks helps them to be more effective in their job of onloading and offloading oxygen. It's a shorter distance that oxygen has to diffuse. 
In addition to that, your, your mature red blood cells don't have any organelles. So you can see in this thing, um, there's no nucleus, there's no mitochondria, no Golgi apparatus, et cetera. So no organelles in these things. They are basically just bags of hemoglobin. So your hemoglobin is down here. So they're just these bags of hemoglobin, which is the protein that actually binds to oxygen. Um, and so the good thing is, if they don't have any of those organelles, then they're able to carry more oxygen. So they can carry a pretty substantial amount of oxygen. We'll get to the specific number here in a second. Um, but no, without the organelles, there's nothing to crowd out the hemoglobin so they can carry more oxygen per red blood cell. But the downside to that, of course, is that if there's no nucleus, then there's no instructions for building proteins. And if we don't have instructions for building proteins, we don't have the instructions to repair the cell. So because mature red blood cells lack a nucleus, they can't repair themselves, and so they tend to have a fairly short lifespan. So typically, red blood cells uh, only stick around for somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four months. So usually 90 to 120 days is the number you'll, you'll see thrown around there. And so again, it's because of they sort of accumulate this wear and tear, and then eventually they can't repair themselves, and so they get picked up by the spleen, and we break them down, and we excrete them. Um, or we recycle some parts of them, and then excrete some of the rest. Another thing is, so they don't have mitochondria, so they, they can't produce energy aerobically, so they have to produce energy anaerobically. So they use glycolysis to produce what, what energy they need to produce. So they do uh, produce a little bit of lactate all the time. Um, other things, they're pretty elastic, so they're able to change shape pretty easily and to bounce back, um, which matters because in some of your smaller capillaries, those may just be um, one cell layer thick, so just the endothelium. And so that's obviously gonna be a pretty small vessel that may, that'll, that will compress the red blood cells, kind of push them down and squish them, and then they'll have to bounce back once they've gotten through that uh, really tiny blood vessel. And so they're really elastic, so they're able to do that very effectively. So again, the primary functions, transport oxygen. So that's the number one thing they do. They do transport a small amount of carbon dioxide, um, but most of the carbon dioxide we actually transport in uh, the plasma. So it's not bound, um, or it's not bound up, I guess, in the red blood cell. So red blood cell's primary job, transport oxygen. And the actual protein that does that is hemoglobin. And so you can see the abbreviation for hemoglobin here is HB. And so this is a, an individual little hemoglobin molecule. So you can see that it has um, four chains. So, and the chains are these long strings of proteins. So, that, so they're polypeptide chains. They're these long strings of proteins. Um, and so you've got two beta globin chains so here's one, and then here's the other one. And then two alpha globin chains, so here's one, and then here's the other one. And then each of those chains has an iron-containing heme group. And so that heme group is what actually binds to oxygen. So for each hemoglobin molecule, each little heme group, and there are one, two, three, four, because there are four chains, each little hemoglobin molecule can bind to one molecule of oxygen so each hemoglobin molecule, that, or sorry, each, each hemoglobin molecule can bind to four because each heme group um, binds to one molecule of oxygen. So each hemoglobin will bind to four oxygen molecules. And we have about 250 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell, which means that each individual red blood cell can scoop up about a billion molecules of oxygen. So each one can hold quite a few. And so it is that heme group, that iron-containing group, that gives blood, or specifically gives red blood cells, their red color. All right, so the production of red blood cells is known as erythropoiesis. So uh, a tissue that is erythropoietic is a tissue that generates blood cells. So erythropoiesis is the production of red blood cells, and it happens in red bone marrow, um, when we're little, so when we're infants, um, the bones have, uh, including the long bones, have a lot of red marrow in them as well. But as we age, as we mature, um, that red marrow that produces red blood cells <clears throat> gets replaced by yellow marrow, and uh, the yellow marrow is fat. So by the time we're older, um, so into childhood and then into adulthood, the 
number or the areas where there is red marrow, the erythropoietic tissue, um, is, is largely restricted to the flat bones. So like in your ribs, in your pelvis, in your skull, your sternum, your scapulas, um, those are sites of erythropoiesis. And then also the proximal ends of the humerus and of the femur. So like inside of the head of the femur and inside of the head of the humerus, both of those uh, contain some red marrow as well. So we primarily make blood cells then in our flat bones. And on average, we make about an ounce of new blood per day. So we're churning out billions of new blood cells per day. So it's a, it's a pretty high number. And so in order to churn out those uh, billions of blood cells every day, we have to have the appropriate ingredients to do that. And so the first one is iron. So you have to have sufficient iron intake to be able to uh, create those heme groups that are part of, again, the uh, hemoglobin. And so in terms of iron, from a dietary standpoint, there's two types of iron that you can take in. There's heme iron and non-heme iron. Heme iron comes from animal sources. So if you eat you know, uh, beef, chicken, um, liver, if you're into that sort of a thing, that is heme iron. And so the reason it matters is heme iron is easier to absorb in the intestine. So heme iron is absorbed at a rate of somewhere between 10 and 35% um, in the small intestine, as opposed to non-heme iron comes from plant sources. So things like um, spinach, beans, lentils, oatmeal, those are going to have non-heme iron, and we don't absorb that nearly as effectively as we do heme iron. So we only absorb about 2 to 5 percent of the heme iron, or sorry, 2, two to 5 percent of the non-heme iron in the small intestine as opposed to 10 to 35 percent of the heme iron. So uh, why that matters, somebody who is vegetarian is going to get, of course, a bunch of non-heme sources, but they don't absorb very much of it. So people who are vegetarian are more likely to be uh, anemic, to not have enough um, hemoglobin. And so because of that, may have fatigue, may appear pale, all those kinds of things. Um, you can improve your absorption of iron um, by in including both a, a combination of heme and non-heme sources. For whatever reason, when they're both present, we tend to increase the uptake of both. The other thing is that vitamin C facilitates the uptake of iron. And so one of the um, some common dietary advice that people are given if they're anemic is to combine their iron intake with, you know, orange juice um, or things that are um, fortified with vitamin C. So things like um, V8, a number of other juices that are fortified with vitamin C. So if you consume that with your iron, then that'll increase the uptake. Conversely, um, things that are high in fiber or um, drinks that have a, a chemical in them called tannins. So that's primarily found in coffee and tea. Um, those can block or deep not block, but they'll decrease iron absorption. So if you you know um, had a bunch of plant sources of iron and were drinking tea or coffee with them, then that would um, definitely hamper your iron absorption there. So in addition to the iron for our heme groups on our hemoglobin, we also have to consume a sufficient amount of B12. And so B12 is found in animal products, things like fish, meat, uh, poultry, milk, and eggs. Um, and so the reason that B12 and also folic acid are important is that they're both um, needed for normal DNA synthesis. And so if you're churning out billions of red blood cells a day, before red blood cells mature, they do have a nucleus, um, but they, kick, they uh, eject it whenever they mature. Um, so if we are producing billions of red blood cells a day, we're going to need to produce lots and lots of DNA, right? And so in order to allow for cell replication, we have to ensure that we have sufficient intake of B12 and folic acid. Um, and so again, since B12 is found primarily in animal products, that's another place where um, vegetarians might run into some problems as they may be um, deficient in their B12 intake. Folic acid, on the other hand, found primarily from plant sources. So folic acid is found in your leafy greens, so things like spinach, kale, um, citrus fruits, beans, breads, rice, and pasta, because pasta is typically fortified. So if you consume enough of those things, you'll be able to make uh, red blood cells. One of the interesting things about B12 uh, is that there is an, a specific type of anemia that is, I'm going to say specific twice in one sentence, a, a type of anemia that is specific to a uh, B12 deficiency. So B12 in all those animal products um, 
gets to our intestine, but then we have to absorb it. And in order to absorb B12, you have to have a, a substance that is secreted by the stomach that's called intrinsic factor. So um, intrinsic factor made in the stomach then uh, migrates with our food through the stomach into the small intestine where then it helps, uh, it binds with B12, intrinsic factor binds with B12 in the intestine and then we're able to absorb B12. So the problem becomes if you don't um, make intrinsic factor in your stomach, then you can't absorb B12, and if you can't absorb B12, you can't produce fast replicating cells in particular, like your red blood cells. And so then those people tend to become anemic, not because they don't have sufficient intake of iron, but instead because they don't, they're not able to absorb B12, and so they're not able to make enough DNA quickly enough to allow for that rapid production of red blood cells. Um, and so that particular type of anemia is called pernicious anemia. And in the early part of the 20th century and before, um, that was something that was a fatal condition. So what typically happens with pernicious anemia is that the, the individual has an autoimmune disorder. And so the auto, an autoimmune disorder is one where your immune system is attacking your own body unintentionally, right? It thinks, there's, it thinks it, your body is an invader, and so your own immune system attacks your tissue. So we see that uh, other examples are things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or celiac disease. Both of those would fall into the same category. Um, Crohn's disease is also in there. Um, so anyway, if in someone who has pernicious anemia, their immune system has attacked those cells in the stomach that make intrinsic factor. Because we don't have intrinsic factor, we can absorb B12, so they can't make enough um, red blood cells. The interesting thing about this, and the reason I'm telling the story, is, is how it was discovered that something from the stomach was required in order to absorb um, B12. So it was discovered by a physician and scientist in the early 1920s, actually specifically in 1926. The physician's name was George Minot. And so what he did is, is he had a pretty good idea that, that something in the digestive tract was causing this because they would feed patients iron sources and it just didn't work. You know, if somebody has a typical anemia, like an iron deficiency anemia, if you just give them more iron, usually that'll solve the problem. But in these patients with pernicious anemia, more iron didn't solve the problem. And so uh, Minot then went through and started giving the patients a variety of different things and seeing if they would respond. And so uh, some of the patients were given uh, ground chicken liver. Other patients were given half-cooked ground beef. Um, another patient or another set of patients was fed raw hog stomach, raw hog stomach, um, Pretty gross, choked on the words a little bit there. And then, um, this one's worse, another group was fed the regurgitated gastric juices of one of Minot's graduate students. So, um, you know that yellow stuff you throw up uh, when you've thrown up as much as you can when you're really ill? Um, so, Minot got a graduate student to uh, vomit that um, and then fed that to patients. Now, it wasn't straight gastric juice. It was uh, spiced up. It was flavored, if you will, with butter, lemon, and parsley. Um, but the patients who consumed those gastric juices, it fixed, uh, it fixed their pernicious anemia because they were then getting the intrinsic factor from that grad student's stomach. Uh, and so because of that, they were able then to absorb B12. Now, ultimately, as gross as that story is, um, Minot was able to use different liver extracts to produce the same thing, and so ultimately, using the liver extracts, they were able to resolve the issue of pernicious anemia, and then by the early 1930s, that was no longer a deadly condition. And so actually, Minot ended up winning the Nobel for that in 1934. All right, uh, in terms of the destruction of, of uh, erythrocytes of your red blood cells, um, again, they can't repair themselves, so typically their lifespan only lasts somewhere between 90 and 120 days. Um, and when we destroy them, typically in the spleen, we'll pick up the damaged red blood cells, um, we can recycle their iron for use in the production of new red blood cells. Um, and then we lose some of that iron in, uh, in feces, but also in sweat um, and urine as well. All right. So, this is an older example, um, but if you're not familiar with Lance Armstrong, really successful cyclist. Um, so, he won seven consecutive Tours de France 
uh, between 1999 and 2005. So the Tour de France covers 2,200 miles over 21 stages uh, in 23 days. So riding over, uh, over 2,200 miles in 23 days. Like just finishing that is obviously an accomplishment, but um, the leading tour riders average about 25 miles an hour over the course of that race. So, um, I mean, even on a good day on a stationary bike for an, like an hour, I'm averaging 18 and I feel pretty good. Uh, and that is not good, apparently. Um, so yeah, so they're maintaining, they're, they're you know, cycling these amazing distances going just crazy fast, um, again, for a little over three weeks. So it's a really impressive accomplishment just to be able to do it. And not only, of course, did Lance Armstrong do the race seven times in a row, but he won the race seven times in a row. And so my question for you is, how was he so dominant at uh, the Tour de France? How was he so dominant in cycling? Um, and the answer is, well, the answer is kind of a threefold answer. One, really good genetics. Two, good work ethic. And three, of course, if you know anything about Lance Armstrong, uh, there were some drugs involved. So one of the things that helped him uh, rise above the rest of the competitors, because of course everybody who's at the Tour de France probably has a pretty good work ethic and probably has some pretty good genetics. Um, so one of the things that helped him rise above the rest and to be so dominant that he could win seven consecutive um, was blood doping. And so there's a number of different ways to do blood doping, but effectively what you're trying to do is to increase the number of red blood cells that you have. Because the more red blood cells that you have, the more oxygen you can transport, and the more oxygen you can transport, the more energy, the more ATP you can make aerobically, and so then you can uh, have higher intensity muscle contractions for longer. You can just you can provide the fuel for the muscle contraction um, more effectively. So anything you can do to raise your red blood cell count, deliver more oxygen, produce more energy, and that will increase your endurance. Uh, and so one of the ways to do that is through transfusions. And so um, actually, I'm going to back up. I'm going to go here first. So erythropoietin is a hormone. Uh, it's, the abbreviation for that's EPO. And so erythropoietin, that hormone, EPO, is produced by the kidneys in response to um, low blood oxygenation. So for example, if you go and donate blood, you, you'll give up a pint of blood. And in response to that, you'll have decreased oxygenation of the blood. And so you're, you've got special cells in the kidneys that'll sense that. They'll increase their production of EPO. EPO then uh, stimulates the red marrow to make more red blood cells until you get back up to normal. And then we stop producing EPO and then our uh, production of red blood cells in the red marrow goes back to its normal rate, and then everything's good. Um, a similar thing happens if you go to altitude. So if I were to fly to Mexico City today, because I think their altitude is a little over 7,000 feet above sea level, um, that's medium altitude. So if you flew to Mexico City today, what you're gonna get is there's uh, less pressure driving oxygen into your lungs, and thus less pressure driving oxygen into the blood. So you get a reduced oxygenation of the blood. Um, and so because the blood has less oxygen content, not because you lost blood, but because there's just less, uh, less of a driving force, less barometric pressure, pushing the oxygen into the blood, you get reduced oxygenation, that's gonna cause the release of EPO, and then you're gonna produce more red blood cells. So we can get that at altitude as well. So, um, what athletes would do then is to just take the hormone, you just take EPO, and then you produce more red blood cells, you've improved your performance. Now in 2000, there was a test developed for that. So uh, when Lance's run started in 1999, there wasn't a test for EPO, but early on in his, uh, in his run of dominance, there was an EPO test, so you couldn't use that anymore. And so then, what cyclists would do is to do transfusions. And so what they would do is several months out before whatever race that they were trying to peak for, they would uh, donate some blood. And then what would happen is the blood would be spun down, kind of like the picture I was showing you here. Back up. So the blood would be spun down like this. They would pull out the red blood cells and freeze those and then re-inject the plasma. And so in response then, the body's gonna make new red blood cells. And then what you do is over the course of the race, you just re-inject those red blood cells that you had taken out and frozen previously to artificially increase your red blood cell count. And again, now you can transport more oxygen so you can improve your endurance. Before uh, the EPO test was developed, one of the things that international organizations would do is to institute hematocrit limits. 
So remember that your hematocrit is the percentage of your blood that is red blood cells. And so um, also remember that I said average for men is 47%, but they could be naturally as high as 52, naturally as low as 42%. And so international organizations said, okay, we're going to set a limit on hematocrit that you can't be above 53 or 54%. Basically, the assumption then is if your hematocrit is above that level, you did something artificial to produce that. We don't know what it was, but somehow you're cheating to get your uh, red blood cell uh, count that high. And so they use that with transfusions as well, because transfusions, um, obviously it's your own blood, so there's not going to be any, anything to detect. And so um, hematocrit limits then can help um, catch, I guess, people who might be doing transfusions. And then the last thing on there are synthetic oxygen carriers. Um, and so that's what can be used in the short term if there's no uh, blood available for transfusion. Um, sometimes synthetic oxygen carriers are used like in emergency situations. So um, I've heard some cyclists would use those as well. Um, one of the things about cycling that I should point out, so you know, Lance obviously then you know, became this, this bad guy because he, he cheated, right? He used, he used drugs and he won. Um, but one of the things to point out about cycling, because I, I say this having, so I, I grew up in the Austin area, um, and I graduated from high school in 1999, so like right as he started winning, and I was in college during the early part of his run, and so, you know, cycling was huge in Austin, and everybody wanted to be like Lance, and he's this big ce celebrity around town, because that's where he lived. Um, and so it was interesting talking to friends that I knew um, who were really into cycling, and they were like, ah. Oh, there's no way he's doping because he gets tested so often. And I was of the opposite opinion. I was like, there's no way <laughs> that he's won that many races. He's dominated that sport without doping. And the reason that I was of that opinion that he, he of course, had to be doing something was in part because of my understanding of the history of the sport. So from its beginning, cycling has been one of the most drug-laden sports out there. So, for example, in the late 1800s, uh, competitive cyclists were taking things like heroin and cocaine to help improve performance. Um, cyclists also took ether-soaked ether sugar tablets. And so ether uh, in the late 1800s, actually beginning in the 1840s, but in the late 1800s, ether was used as a surgical anesthetic. It was something is, uh, you could breathe in uh, ether, and then it would, it would give you some, some numbing uh, throughout the body. And so if, if you produce numbness then, well, it wouldn't, you know, you would hurt less when you were doing some high intensity cycling. And so potentially that could augment your performance. So um, not surprisingly, from these combinations of heroin, cocaine, and ether, um, the first doping related death in cycling happened in 1886. Um, in addition to that, so cyclists weren't the only ones using interesting uh, drugs at the time. So your early endurance runners were using alcohol, uh, and cyclists were too. Um, alcohol under the, under the idea that um, if you consume alcohol, you know, it, it uh, reduces pain. And so um, there were runners that, um, there's a, an entertaining example of one of the early um, marathoners in the Olympics, and his plan was to do a shot of whiskey every mile. And I think he made it to like mile 12 or 15. So he made it surprisingly far, um, considering. Um, so it wouldn't be uncommon for athletes to drink alcohol during races. Um, that would be tough. Um, but in addition to that, there were runners who used uh, strychnine. And so strychnine is rat poison or an ingredient in rat poison because in high doses, um, strychnine will cause paralysis of the muscles, including the respiratory muscles. And so how it kills rats is it paralyzes their diaphragm, paralyzes their intercostals, and so then the rat suffocates because it can't breathe. But if you take low doses of strychnine, you'll just get some muscle fasciculations. You'll just get some twitches. And so these runners are like, oh, we'll take some strychnine, and so we'll get some muscle twitching, and then you know, you know, you feel like you can run faster. Um, and cyclists, I think, would take strychnine as well. Um, again, late late nineteen late eighteen uh, hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, when you see this. So in terms of you know Lance Armstrong and and he cheated and he doped. Well, yeah, but that was certainly bound up with the history of cycling. Uh, he, he wasn't the first cyclist to use some interesting things to help improve his performance. Um, in addition to that, more recently than the early 1900s, um, there was a cyclist at the 1960 Rome Games who died. Um, there, is, there is some controversy over whether he died of heat stroke or, or whether it was a doping-related death. But in 1967, at the Tour de France, there was a British cyclist named Tim Simpson who died um, from amphetamine overuse. So um, again, 
drug use on the Tour de France is not uh, not new and certainly was not unique to Lance Armstrong. And so having said that Tim Simpson died in 1967 on the Tour, um, the Olympics instituted drug testing for stimulants, so for amphetamines, in 1968, the following year. And then they started anabolic steroid testing in 1976. In addition to blood doping, Lance Armstrong was also using testosterone, and as mentioned earlier, testosterone increases red blood cell production, and so rather than taking um, the hormone that most directly increases red blood cell production, you can also take testosterone to do uh, the same thing, but not to the same extent. And then, as mentioned earlier, altitude can cause you to uh, increase red blood cell production as well. Now the downside, of course, is what happens if, if I have too much? So if I get my hematocrit to, I don't know, let's say 65%, what can happen? Well, if you've got that many red, red blood cells floating around um, in relatively limited space, they can bump into each other and it can cause clots, right? And so then those blood clots can get caught you know, in, in small blood vessels in the brain, that can cause a stroke, then get caught in small blood vessels in the lungs, um, that can cause what's called a pulmonary embolism, they can get caught in the heart, cause a heart attack, and so too much then is obviously problematic and, and could be fatal um, if any of those things happen. So what you've got here is, is the, the negative feedback loop, um, what happens with uh, EPO. So the first thing is, again, if you get um, decreased oxygenation of the blood, whether it's due to a blood loss or because you went to altitude, um, whatever the reason, then that's going to stimulate the production of EPO in the kidneys, which then stimulates the production of red blood cells in the red marrow, which again, one of the places the red marrow is found is in the uh, head of the femur. And then we're going to produce more red blood cells until our oxygen carrying capacity returns to normal limits. And once that happens, then we stop producing EPO, return to normal rate of production of red blood cells in the red marrow, and then we're back to normal. All right, so another case study. Um, so I'll tell you a story about a uh, high school football player named Max Gilpin. And so Max was a sophomore offensive lineman at Ple Pleasure Ridge Park uh, High School, which is just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and in, I forgot to write down the year on this, sorry about that, it's somewhere around 2008, 2010, somewhere in that range. Um, but anyway, so Max is a, a, an offensive lineman at, at this high school, um, let's say in 2008. The year is probably wrong, but that's okay. Um, and so two weeks into practice that year, um, the team is, the football team is, is working on some new drills and basically things are going badly at practice. And so the coach whose name is Jason Stinson is really unhappy with his team's performance. Basically feels like the players are screwing around, they're not paying attention. And so he gets upset with them. Uh, the, the coach Stinson was an offensive lineman himself. He played at the University of Louisville. So he you know, went to school there in Louisville and then took a job out in the suburbs um, coaching high school football after he was done. And so Stenson's mad about the team's performance. He said, okay, if y'all aren't going to play hard, if y'all aren't going to pay attention, what we're going to do is run. So he said, okay, everybody go line up on the sideline, and we're going to run gassers. And so gassers are the football version of punishment running. And so what you do in gassers is you start on one sideline, you run to the other one and back, and then you do that again. So down and back, down and back two times. Um, so it's you know, a little over 200-yard sprint in full pads. And so Stenson tells the team that, quote, we're going to run until somebody quits, end quote. And so the team ran for 40 minutes. So again, this is only two weeks into practice. Players are somewhat acclimated to the heat, um, mostly acclimated to the heat, I would say. Um, but it is still relatively hot. So this particular day in Louisville, it was about 94 degrees with relatively high humidity. So it's kind of just hot and sticky. Um, so after the running is over, again, after 40 minutes of gassers, um, this player, Max Gilpin, reaches the sideline and then vomits and falls to the ground unconscious. So his dad was there watching practice, and his dad goes and runs to his aid. Three of the assistant coaches go and run to his aid, and they dump the water coolers over the top of him, so basically just douse him in ice water, and then they remove his socks. I'm not sure why they went socks, but they did, um, and Ma Max didn't regain consciousness. And so after a few minutes of waiting for him to regain consciousness, somebody calls 911. So the ambulance gets there, transports Max to the hospital, 
and when he gets to the hospital, his core temperature is 107 degrees. And so obviously your nor normal core temperature is somewhere around nine, uh, 98.6. His, again, when he gets to the hospital is 107. And so unfortunately, a few days later, um, so Max is obviously hospitalized, and unfortunately he passes. And so the question is, you know, what happened? Why, why did he die? And well, the answer is, of course, that he died of heat stroke. Um, and so effectively what happens here and how this is related, because remember one of the functions of blood is to help us cool ourselves off, to help us maintain our core temperature. And so what we do when we get hot is we dilate the blood vessels near the skin surface, we give up plasma volume to um, evaporate, and then when it evaporates that's going to help cool us off. Um, but if we're directing more blood flow to the skin surface, what we're gonna do is to cut off blood flow elsewhere, because you only have five liters of blood, can't direct it everywhere all the time. I think the, the other stat is if you dilate all your blood vessels, I think the, the cardiovascular system can accommodate like 20 liters of blood, something in that neighborhood. So because of that, we have to direct blood flow where it's needed most and then direct it away from where we don't need it right now. So during exercise, what we'll do is we'll close down blood vessels, which is vasoconstriction. We'll close down blood vessels in the, um, in the abdomen largely, so we'll, we'll direct blood flow away from the intestines, away from the stomach, the kidneys, the liver, et cetera, and then toward the working musculature and toward the skin surface. Well, during intense exercise, like sprints, like these 200-yard sprints, um, we actually even direct a little bit less blood flow to the uh, skin surface and direct more toward the working musculature because they have to, the muscles have to be able to, um, we have to have oxygen to allow the muscles to make ATP to continue the exercise. Um, so we don't direct quite as much blood flow to the skin surface during really intense exercise. So um, what happened here then is with all these sprints, um, Max is progressively losing blood volume, so you're progressively giving up um, plasma volume. And so the blood's getting increasingly thick. That makes it uh, for a more difficult workload on the heart because the blood is effectively, it's more viscous, it's thicker, right? So then the blood, uh, the heart, sorry, has to beat faster because you have a lower blood volume. And as the intensity of the exercise increases, we're directing less blood flow to the skin surface, so we're not quite as good at cooling ourselves. So the blood gets progressively hotter. The heart's having to work harder. So then the heart gets hotter. You get what's called cardiac hyperthermia. So the heart's getting progressively hotter. At the same time, the brain is getting hotter, and so then the brain gets less effective at directing that blood flow where it should go. So you get this uh, central nervous system or this brain hyperthermia. And in addition to that, as this continues for a prolonged period of time, remember that we're, we're decreasing blood flow to the abdominal organs, including the small intestine. And so with decreased blood flow and in increased temperature, what you can get is death of some of the cells in the intestines. And so remember that those cells have tight junctions between them to keep things like bacteria, viruses, etc., cetera, um, in the lumen of the intestine and out of the bloodstream. Well, if those cells die because of a uh, combination of heat and lack of oxygen, then they become less effective as a barrier. And so then things like bacteria get into the bloodstream and then they circulate throughout the body and can cause a systemic infection. In addition to that, the muscles working at really high intensity and relatively high temperatures, that's also going to damage the membranes of the muscle, and so they're going to start to leak their contents into the bloodstream as well, and the muscles are going to leak a really large protein called myoglobin, which is similar to hemoglobin. It's, it's uh, in, in your slow twitch fibers, and myoglobin shuttles oxygen from the blood to the mitochondria of the cell. Um, and myoglobin, though, needs to stay inside of our muscle cells because when it leaks out into the blood, eventually it makes its way to the kidneys, where once myoglobin's in the kidneys, it um, can cause kidney failure. It uh, interferes with the, the function of the kidneys, the reabsorption of sodium and potassium, those kinds of things. Um, and so then that can cause kidney failure. Kidney failure, in turn, can cause electrolyte imbalances, which then can cause heart arrhythmias and can cause... Uh, a heart attack, okay? And so what ultimately kills somebody who has heat stroke is what's called multi-system organ failure. So you got too hot, uh, the heart overheated, the brain overheated, you had uh, heat-related damage to the internal organs, you had heat-related damage to the muscles, then led to kidney failure, can then lead to an arrhythmia um, and stoppage of the heart. So um, Exertional heat stroke then is defined as having a core temperature over 104. Um, 
And one of the keys appears to be minimizing your time over 105. So I've seen some research that um, you could start to get central nervous system damage, so brain damage, if you're at uh, 105 or higher for more than 30 minutes. Um, and so again, why this all ties into what we're talking about here is that that's the primary job of the blood is to help us to maintain our core temperature. But, um, you know, the blood is only so effective. We can only give up so much fluid and only so much can evaporate um, to keep our core temperature down. Another important point is on here is that um, heat stroke can happen in the absence of dehydration. So we assume, you know, as, as long as you stay pretty well hydrated, you're, you're at a lower risk of suffering from heat stroke, which is semi-true. Uh, but it's, the primary driver is actually the intensity of the exercise. So the more intense the exercise, like the faster you're running, um, the more ATP you're using. And one of the byproducts of breaking down ATP is heat. And so the more intense the exercise, the more heat you give off, which you probably know, you know, from living in Wisconsin, um, if you go outside and walk, you're not going to generate enough heat to keep yourself warm. But if you go outside and run, you might. So the more intense the exercise, the more heat you give off. So because they're doing really intense exercise, because they're doing sprints, generating a lot of heat, and they're generating heat faster than you can get rid of it through evaporative cooling, which is what happens when you sweat. Um, so one of the things I would want you to know is that um, you can have heat issues, you can have heat stroke, even if you have a well-hydrated athlete, if they're working out at high intensity and at high temperatures. Um, a similar condition uh, is called heat exhaustion. So heat stroke is the, the fatal one. Um, heat exhaustion is basically you just can't keep up. And so what happens there is with heat exhaustion, again, you know, you're going to have pretty significant fluid, fluid losses to sweat. Um, and so that makes it harder for the heart to work. The heart becomes a less effective pump. And so you just can't deliver oxygen to the tissues fast enough to keep going. And so ultimately the athlete has to stop. And so that's heat exhaustion. They just can't continue. And so heat exhaustion is actually the safety break to keep you from getting into heat stroke. So you, you end up stopping the exercise. You just can't keep up with the intensity. You have to slow down or stop before you get to this point. Um, and then heat syncope, syncope is fainting. Um, so heat syncope is typically in people who are not acclimated to the heat. Um, they'll go out, um, so you'll see this again, having grown up in Texas, uh, you'll see this early on in football practice in the fall where kids go out um, and you know, it's, it's 105 degrees and they've been inside all summer because who wants to be outside when it's that hot? Um, but you go out there for football practice and sometimes people will just fall out. And so what happens there is, I mentioned that process of blood shunting or directing the blood where it needs to go. Um, and so when you're out there in the heat, you got to direct blood flow to the skin and away from the abdominal organs. And so if the body's not used to that heat stress, it basically dilates too many blood vessels. And so you have um, still a pretty good amount of blood flow in the abdominal organs. Now you've increased blood flow to the skin surface. And so in doing that, you're getting less blood flow coming back to the heart and less to the brain. And so then that can uh, cause you to faint because the brain's not getting enough blood flow. Um, very temporarily. Once, once the person faints and then, you know, is, is lying horizontally on the ground, brain gets its blood flow back and they usually come back to pretty quick. Um, so heat syncope or, or fainting in the heat is usually the result of or caused by um, somebody who's not acclimated to the heat. Typically heat acclimatization takes uh, 10 to 14 days. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens as part of the acclimatization process is that you have more plasma volume. So in response to endurance training or heat exposure, the blood is going to hang on to more plasma. And so because of that, you're able to cool yourself more effectively. And so one of the things that happens when you're acclimated to the heat is you actually start sweating more and you start sweating earlier. And the sweat that you have, if you're used to the heat, is uh, even more water than normal. Um, you have a lower concentration of things like uh, sodium in it, lower concentration of um, urea, et cetera in that sweat. So it's basically almost uh, almost all water. So um, that's one of those adaptations to heat. So one of the things that can happen then, or, or there's some crossover then between adaptations to endurance exercise, more plasma volume, or adaptations to the heat, more plasma volume. And so then there's some crossover between the two. There should be a little bit of a boost to your endurance, but primarily a, a boost to your um, ability to tolerate heat if you are well conditioned. All right, and one more story. Let's see where we're at for time. Yeah, so we'll do one more story and then I'll make a separate video. All right, so this athlete, his name is Eric Gall, 
And this one I have a date for. In August of 2016, uh, is the first day of football practice at Shadron State College, which is a school, uh, I think they're Division II, in northwestern Nebraska. And so Eric Gall is a, a new player there. He was, he was from Florida, and he had just transferred to Shadron State. Um, so as mentioned, so he's a soft, uh, sophomore football player there. On this day in August of 2016, um, the temperature was in the high 80s. So it's pretty warm, but not crazy hot, not in the 90s, as it was uh, in Louisville in the previous case. Um, and so uh, Gall goes along. He's doing really well in drills. But eventually, I think it's about halfway through practice, he pulls himself out of a drill. And he complains of excessive fatigue and cramping. Uh, and the cramping was particularly pronounced uh, in his legs. And so as that progressed, so after he pulls himself out of a drill with this cramping and excessive fatigue, he also then started to complain of severe chest pain and eventually difficulty breathing. And so ultimately, he uh, collapses. The, the athletic trainers call 911. He's transported to the hospital. Um, and unfortunately, he uh, was pronounced dead about an hour after he arrived at the hospital. So the question for you is what happened? And it's not heat, but in this case, what happened was that Gall had sickle cell anemia. And so in sickle cell anemia, you have abnormal hemo hemoglobin. Um, so here's my picture. So there's your, your hemoglobin there. So remember, you've got the alpha chains down here, the beta chains up here, and then our four little hemoglobin, uh, or our four little heme uh, groups right there. And so what ends up happening in somebody who has sickle cell anemia, it's a genetic condition where um, if you have two copies of this gene, then um, you're going to have, uh, rather than sickle cell trait, you're going to have sickle cell anemia. And so effectively what happens is um, in, when the blood gets really low in oxygen content in somebody who has sickle cell anemia, um, these beta chains, so these two, after they offload their oxygen, they are going to um, form these stiff, spiky rods. And so then they can't carry oxygen anymore. And if that happens throughout the hemoglobin molecules inside of a red blood cell, it'll change the shape of a red blood cell. And so you've got your normal red blood cell over here on the left, and then your sickled blood cell here on the right. And the, so those sickled cells can't carry oxygen as effectively as you would imagine. But in addition to that, because of this change in shape, they can't flow through blood vessels like your normally shaped red blood cells. And so they're going to get caught in small blood vessels, and then that's going to develop a clot. And then those clots can cause things like heart attacks, strokes, um, or pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism is where you block a blood vessel in the lungs. And so now everything distal to, everything farther down that blood vessel uh, is cut off. So you can't absorb oxygen any, any further um, downstream from there. And so if somebody has sickle cell anemia, what typically happens then is, is that uh, presentation where you start to get blood clots. Um, that, that's one of the things that causes that severe cramping and pain in the lower legs. And then what would cause the chest pain and difficulty breathing would, would probably be blood clots in the lungs, would be that, those pulmonary embolisms. One of the interesting things about uh, sickle cell anemia, so the, the um, hemoglobin chain sequence, so it's 146 amino acids long. Um, but in somebody who has sickle cell, there's a change in only one. This, this is a valine here that should be a glutamine. Um, there's a change in one of those amino acids, and then that's what produces this condition. So it's a pretty, you know, one out of 146 amino acids, and you get just dramatically different function of the hemoglobin. And so what tends to trigger these attacks, what tends to cause that sickling is, again, excessive offloading of oxygen. And so, or excessively low um, oxygenation of the blood. And so things that can make someone more likely to have a sickle cell attack are being at altitude and particularly exercise at altitude. And so for Eric, um, he at Shadron State wasn't a super high elevation, but it was 3,300, or that area of Nebraska is, is 3,300 feet above sea level. So Denver is 5,200. Um, and here in Whitewater, we're at like 700. Um, so it is, you know, it is uh, starting to get into some low altitude. And so with that, you're going to get reduced oxygenation of the blood. And then if you're exercising, you're going to get a lot of offloading of oxygen from the blood, particularly if you are exercising in the heat. Um, we'll talk later about the Bohr effect. But, but one of the aspects of the Bohr effect is that um, when the blood heats up, 
hemoglobin gives up its oxygen to the tissues more readily, which is good during exercise because we want to, you know, you get, during exercise you get hot, your core temperature increases, and you want to be able to offload oxygen to those working tissues more effectively. But in some of you have sickle cell anemia, that can then lead to the sickling of the hemoglobin. So people who have sickle cell anemia are particularly predisposed to having a sickle cell attack or event, um, exercising at high intensity in the heat and at altitude, which is all of the three things that Eric Gall was doing. So um, sickle cell attacks, um, not unheard of among NCAA athletes. Between 2000 and 2016, 11 NCAA uh, Division I players died related to complications from sickle cell. And we've even, even seen um, sickle cell issues in the NFL. So for example, in 2007, Ryan Clark, who's now a commentator on ESPN, at the time, he was a safety for the Steelers, uh, and he was rushed to the hospital during a game in Denver when he started having really severe side pain, and so uh, left side pain. What, what he was having was one of, uh, he was having a sickle cell attack, and, and the particular blood clot was in his spleen. And so um, after that event, or after he was hospitalized, uh, he had to have his spleen and gallbladder removed, and then he was able to play for seven more years after that event, but every time the team went to Denver, he was deactivated. So again, it's that combination of high intensity exercise um, at altitude, and then if you add heat, that's just one more thing that makes it more likely. And then he doesn't play for the Packers anymore. I think he uh, plays for the Cowboys now, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, but Ty Montgomery, who when he was with the Packers, um, had to miss time in 2016 after finding blood in his urine um, after playing the Bears, and then they discovered that he uh, had had a, a minor sickle cell issue there. All right. So anemias, um, we'll come back, we'll do anemias next time. So I'll make a, a little shorter video because I think we're over an hour now. Yeah, we are. So I'll make another shorter video on uh, the remainder of the stuff. There's not too much left. Should be probably another maybe 45 minutes, but hopefully more like 30. So we'll see you next time.